Yeah, this is our sevenfold path, chakra seven. All right, so we're going to begin with a little breathing exercise, a little centering exercise. So I ask you to get yourself comfortably situated. And as you close your eyes, focus on your breath and bring it from the base of your spine on the inhale, up your back to the top of your head, and your exhale. Let the breath come down again to the base of your spine, forming that circuit around your chakras. From the base of your back on the inhale, and the top of your head, and turning on the exhale. Suggesting that this unites all seven chakras in one continuous flow. And now focus on the seventh chakra on the top of your head and envision a ball of violet light. Suggest that your ability to open and to trust spiritual guidance will increase through our work during this month. Remind yourself of the power of your intention. That your clear and loving intention is what commands the universe. So once again, suggest that your ability to open and trust spiritual guidance will increase through our work during this month. And let yourself take a couple of deep and clearing breaths and come on back. All right. So we're going to head on up to number seven, going to the seventh chakra today. And I'm quite pleased. I'm excited about this. It feels like we have elected... See, what do we know now? I think, oh, okay, we're doing the class, we're just doing the chakra, and this one, and this one, and this one. But our intentions have really been working on our energy centers, even though we may not be aware of it. We may be out to lunch. Because <laughs> it's, like, it's not our mind that is programming this. It was our heart mm -hmm. that said, yeah, this is what I'm signing up for. This is what I want. And that is much more powerful. And you may want to have some write list and take notes as I go through the material of the seventh chakra. Because as usual, there are various questions and, and sometimes you get insights along the way. You just want to make note of. Here, the individual and the divine are at last linked in their common field of consciousness in the seventh chakra. The crown, it's our work to seek to free our consciousness from its usual distractions to experience its own limitless nature. This affords us the possibility of that ecstatic culmination of the liberating current in its final goal of ultimate freedom, mukti. And the seventh chakra is the ultimate source of awakening. From this awakening, divine wisdom condenses into ever firmer realities extending downward through each of the chakras. So it's that opening from which divine wisdom manifests. The chakras condense consciousness into various qualities of manifestation within and around us. In Sanskrit, these qualities are called tattvas. Manifestation begins in consciousness with an initial conception. You first conceive of an idea. Then you daydream about it by creating pictures or blueprints, the sixth chakra. You talk about it with others, the fifth chakra. You bring it into relationship, the fourth chakra. You give it energy, the third chakra. You achieve connection, chakra two. And finally manifest it on the physical plane, chakra one. In the crown, is the dimensionless point of awareness, wise but a neutral witness to the operation of your personal programs. You can influence these programs, get the bugs out of them, and write new programs, all from a place that is both within and beyond your ordinary existence through opening to divine wisdom. This is what allows us to rewrite some of the scripts, like how we communicate, how we identify ourselves. You know, each of the chakras, each of the tasks that the chakras specialize in can be divinely informed when the seventh chakra is open. 
you can move beyond words into the transcendent planes of meditation and awareness and come to the end of the rainbow journey only to discover it's a new beginning. How to deepen your connection to the seventh chakra, your body. The seventh chakra relates to the general intelligence of the body. We develop this intelligence through educating the body. Realize that the body is a temple for the divine within. Too much focus on the seventh chakra can lead to just being in our head. So the wisdom doesn't just stay on the intellectual plane. It filters down into every chakra. The gland in the body that's associated with the seventh chakra is the pituitary gland. It's located at the base of the brain, surrounded by bone except for a stalk to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus forms the major link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So it synthesizes nine different hormones, regulates growth, reproduction, metabolism, skin pigmentation, and stimulates other glands, such as the thyroid and adrenals. It is indeed the master gland. So think of your master gland regulating your endocrine system being bathed each day in divine wisdom. You know, you're thinking, well, i got to figure out what's the best diet and what's the best exercise program and what's... Mm, sometimes it's just too much for our widow brains. And so the willingness to be informed through guidance takes a lot of that burden off our ego. Hmm. <laughs> Psychological issues. The seventh chakra is related to universal identity which is oriented to self-knowledge. It allows us to surrender to something larger and wiser than our individual consciousness. Lower identities then become like layers of clothing, you know, necessary for various life situations. You know, like you were saying, Julie, well, I got to tune up my mind and going into work, you know, mm -hmm. and I wear that identity during the day. But these identities are used with the knowledge that they are decoration for the eternal self that lies within. Attachment is the demon of the seventh chakra. Attachment to the particular keeps us from realizing the universal and the infinite. Self-initiated plans may be in competition with the larger plan of spirit. Oh yes, I have to have that candy-striped Cadillac. That will be the pinnacle of life for me. You know, so my ego is latched on to a particular picture or a particular vision. Releasing attachment allows the upward current to move towards its goal of freedom. Attachments must be held in balance with commitments. So if I let my attachments to the particular, this relationship, this is it. I have to have this person in my life or Life is not worth living. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a person in my life, but if I get overly attached to the person, taking it out of balance, out of focus, then my commitment to serve the highest good is interfered with both for me and for them. I fulfill my relationship with another by keeping my commitment to my higher self. When I let go of that and try to make a person or an activity, a job or whatever it is, give me purpose, then I'm putting way too much pressure on them. <laughs> They're likely to bolt. And they get it. They get it. I mean, part of them might go into collusion with it. They like that because they want to be attached to you. And now we've got a wonderful marriage of enmeshment. And that becomes stifling and will generally lead to a lot of frustration. The realms of the lower chakras do require commitment, consistency, and sometimes struggle. Commitment is made more powerful when it is free from the lust for particular results. So the commitment to tell the truth, the commitment to be unconditionally loving, 
the commitment to be in my power. It may not be with that particular job, or it may not be with that particular person, or I may not get heard by that crowd of folks. Releasing an attachment leaves us free to commit more fully, based on intention rather than results. So my intention is to fully express my light and my love. And that may not look like having my name and lights on Broadway. Examining your attachments. This is a possible exercise. We're not going to do it together here, but if it piques your interest, you may do this. Make a list of your attachments and the reasons that you feel attached to them. Then imagine a write about what might be possible if these attachments were released. If some attachments are particularly sticky, write about them at length. And after careful meditation, burn the paper that you've written all of this with the intention of relinquishing the attachments. So it's a, it's a ritual. And by attachments, that's not all the commitments we have, but that's things that we feel are out of balance. Attachments are in distinction to commitments. So I have a commitment to live my truth. My attachment may be, I've got to be a famous author. You know, if I don't get this book published, how could my truth be out in the world, for Christ's sake? You know? And so I get obsessed with that, and so on. So the commitment to live the full life is beyond any particular form. So just doing this ritual, you know, burning the paper that you've written the attachments on doesn't necessarily, oh, now it's all gone. You know, you still have to follow through. But rituals can have a lot of oomph to them, as much as we're willing to give them. So examine your attachments to people, places, possessions, your home, money, looking good, either faultless or superior, looking good physically, pleasure, self-gratification, power, being right, what other people think of you, staying young, knowing the answers, suffering, ooh, how could you mean? I could have an attachment to suffering. Freedom? What? Freedom? How does that get in the list? Oh, no, no, I can't make any commitment for the weekend. I have to be free. Spiritual practice. Wow, spiritual practice? You can't get too much of that, can you? <laughs> hey, anything that's a wonderful tool, you can get a glut on the market of it. You go out of balance with it. Success. Children? What do you mean? How could you attach it to children? Aren't you supposed to love them unconditionally and do whatever? Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There again, we can go overboard and we're attached to the way they have to behave or the way I have to somehow get them on the right track. Again, this isn't mean. Oh, whatever. You know, no, I do have a responsibility with my children, a job, but it's different from attachment. Well, I can see what you mean. And for children, my sons are both grown, but yet I feel that they, or I used to feel, that they had to call me every week. They had right. to acknowledge me. Right. And if they did something with their dad, or if they did something with other friends, and I didn't hear from them, oh my God, it was awful. I mean, I was in tears. Yeah. I let it go. And now I'm fine. You know, it, yeah. but I, I can understand. <laughs> right. Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. I and mean, it's it, a it physical just, thing. It's not yeah, just like I'm a little yeah. bothered. No, it's like, ugh. Yeah. Choking me. I, I just couldn't exist without hearing from my kids, from my right. boys. And how dare they do something with the in law? You know? right, 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 right. I'm their mother and I'm alone and they should be contacting me. <laughs> but I've let it go. <laughs> That's great. That, I understand. Yeah. There's two more on the list here. Attachment to the past. Been there too. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Or attachment to the future. Mm -hmm. Isn't it going to be great 
you know, we all get together and we're spreading wellness in the Milwaukee community and, and the city really acknowledges the value of raising its consciousness and that would be good when that comes about. Of course now it's kind of meaning. <laughs> so it's all attached to it. out there someday you know, when you're not working in that sweatshop anymore. <laughs> isn't that going to be great? What are you thinking about? What are the primary dwelling places of your consciousness? We're going to do a little inquiry here, a chakra survey. On your handout, on the second page, the cover page, the first page, and the page after that, there's a little graph that's got chakra one, chakra two, chakra three, chakra one. Yeah. Uh, okay, now we're going to go through and mark on the graph as if you had an internal monitor, each time you focused on any of the issues below, how far would the graph rise? So, okay, chakra one, survival issues. <gasps> <laughs> it's like, on the top, you know, okay. Then you put a little dot in the chakra one, like right up on the top. Survival issues, thoughts about safety, livelihood, body, home. Or maybe, yeah, yeah, I can charge over that, you know, but it's not like off the charts. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the issues of each chakra, and we're going to put a dot where you think, you know, from zero to 100 on there, that you get the juice from. In other words, it grabs your attention. So we're going to put a dot on there, and then you're going to have a little connected dot. And you're going to have a, a scientific graph of your chakra energies. All right? So let's go through. You may not want to put the dot there until we read all of them so you have some sense of comparison. You know, do it however you want to. Survival issues. Thoughts about safety, livelihood, the body, and home. Chakra two. Feelings and sexuality. Worry about how things feel. Thinking about sex longing for something. Chakra three, how you're doing, activity, what you're going to or should do. Chakra four, relationships, how your relationships are going. Chakra five, conversation, internal chatter, explaining yourself, arguing, planning what to say. Chakra six, fantasy, fantasizing, daydreaming, imagining, remembering, or generally being out of the present time. Chakra seven, spirituality, you know, obsessing about God, goddess, spirit, or worship. So let's take a moment right now, and we're not going to spend a long time on this, but just make a little dot on each one, and then connect the dots and, and see what your grasp looks like. So Jim, is this like an emotional thing, or is it just where I feel I am, you know, with my understanding of these things, or how I am living my life with them? Uh, this is more on how I'm preoccupied or attached. The lower so, the number, the better the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. the higher the number, the... Yeah, the more that's something you want to focus on to work on. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Good clarification, Kim. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, after connecting your dots, how does your graph look? Are you surprised <laughs> by it? Okay. Well, I got a little surprised by it. I thought, hmm, there's an area that I didn't fully realize how I've been putting a lot of energy into. So, it's like, oh, okay. Hmm. I can chill on that. So, I guess everything should be balanced. And if you put too much emphasis on the spiritual, that's not good either. Right. Yeah, we'll give some examples of that. Okay. Any other observations on your chakra obsession chart? <laughs> <laughs> Mine definitely had a peak. And valleys for me. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, the search for meaning. Most of the time, consciousness is busy trying to find meaning. Meaning tells us how to operate and forms the basis of our belief system. Meaning often reflects our belief systems more than they reflect the reality around us. To become enlightened is to pierce through false meanings 
and realize the ultimate meaning of existence, which is unnameable. Our ego doesn't have an inside track on it. So examining our belief systems. The goal of the chakra path is to awaken our consciousness on each and every level of our human potential. In the seventh chakra, awakening is aided by the act of questioning. So here's another exercise you can do. Is pick the chakra in which you showed the biggest spike of attention, or perhaps a chakra that you are struggling with right now. What is the central belief system that makes me behave in this way? Ask yourself the following question. Is this belief really true? My surprise here was that uh, on chakra three, this activity thing, like I really, really keep myself busy, busy. Now I do have specific times that I'm devoted to my spiritual practices, meditation, da da da. But I can even lump them into busyness, you know. Okay, time to meditate. Let's get <laughs> on with the meditation. You know. So the belief system here for me around that is my productivity is my worth. What did I get done? How am I marching on to the grand and glorious fulfillment of my life? Uh, I mentioned to Julie as we were sharing earlier, I ran across a quote this past month in the spiritual reading that kind of shocked me back into a realization. It was a quote by uh, Ellen Watts who said that the purposeful life is without content. And what he meant by that, or what the author of this book, who was Buddhist, meant by that was that if I'm always on purpose, and that, translating that in a yang way, meaning gold driven, I'm missing the flowers along the way. Sorry, gotta save the world, don't have time to smell flowers, talk to my children. And so, obviously, we can become too purpose-driven in that way. And so the Buddhists, to balance that, have a practice of purposelessness. Now, for me, that would be quite an exercise, spending a day, a purposeless day. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I think that the closest I come to that is like with my grandchildren. Because it's just being with them. We don't have to learn the alphabet. Although I do, you know, can see getting into that. You know, it's like, what do you get joy out of? I do get joy out of my work, you know, about fulfilling goals and all of that. And like anything, eh, too much. Time to balance. Time to balance. Is this belief really true? My worth is my productivity is my value. How do I know this? My daddy told me. Does this belief serve me or hinder me? What might be a more productive belief? So, ponder. Anyone else want to share? What belief seems to cause the peak on your chart? Mine was uh, chakra number five. Uh -huh. All the inside chatter and my tends to let that overwhelm me. Um, a long time ago, I read a book and one of the um, statements that, that really stuck with me is if we treated our friends as family as we treat ourselves, we'd never have any friends. Because <laughs> <laughs> wow. that has always stuck with me. It's like, oh my God, I've been living with this outrageous voice inside my head, mm -hmm. believing it, and I just, I keep beating myself down, and why do I do that? Um, so yeah, that's my spike. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is the belief system that holds that in place? I know it comes from childhood. It's, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not fast enough, I'm not perfect, I'm not, uh, I'm not beautiful, I'm not talented. And um, so I know it comes from, you know, from way back then, but it's so ingrained, it's so oh, yeah. hard to overcome that. And that I think I make strides, and then all of a sudden I realize, oh my God, I'm back where I was, or I'm almost back where I was. So it's like millimeters sometimes that I feel I'm working my, my way out of it. And, um, you know, there's days where I, I'm just like, I'm perfect, I'm just the way I am. And then there's other days it's like, oh my God, how can anyone like you? <laughs> okay, so the word that you said several times in there was perfect and perfection. You know, so that is probably the belief system mm -hmm. there. My value equals perfection according to some standard. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you.
mine was the same as yours, Jen, chakra three, and the beliefs underneath that is that what I do makes me worthy, and that I have to be accomplishing all these things. And if I have a day that's very purposelessness, I feel completely lost and like unworthy. Like I just wasted a day because I didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. So. That's, that's all right. So let's look at healing and balancing your seventh chakra. So this is called working the element. Consciousness in the home. Consciousness permeates everything in the home. How aware are you of where you leave things? How you arrange things? How things look or feel? How much consciousness do you have of the way you treat those you live with and the daily tasks of living. Where do you need to pay more attention in order to live more consciously? A sense of the sacred. To create sacred space in a particular place is to invite a deeper awareness of the sacred into your life. So, creating an altar, a place for communion with spirit. How many folks here have created an altar in their home. Okay. So, this act of creation is a prayer and an offering and more important than a finished product. So it's not like, oh, it's got more crystals than uh, Marie's <laughs> altar. Speaking of that, I've really enjoyed, well, been astounded by the altars that have been created this year and the consciousness that's gone into them. My only regret is not having photograph them. <laughs> I think wouldn't that be a great memory of this year, the altars that we created. So. Buddhist monks do elaborate sand paintings as a meditation, and then they're wiped away. Do you know that tradition? They may spend days doing a sand painting, very elaborate, colored, and it's the most intricate work of art. And when it's done, they wipe it away. And it's a whole lesson on the impermanence, not to get attached. It was the journey there. It was not the finished product. That represents the relinquishing of attachment, which, by the way, is the key of the seventh chapter. <laughs> the vibrations of your prayers, meditations, and offerings will build up in the surrounding atmosphere. I think of my futon in my office upstairs as a launching pad, you know. And there's so much positive consciousness that's been infused in it, you know. You just lay down and you're healed. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> if you have that sacred place in your house, you're infusing it with consciousness. Whether it's elaborate or simple, it's not like how many pieces of art, I mean, it could be just an open, bare space. So. You may choose to build an altar in your sacred place, elaborate or simple. A place that's used only for sacred objects. You can build altars to various deities, saints, spirits, depending on your religion or your concepts of deity. You may choose to work with your chakras one at a time, creating an altar for each chakra as you focus on. This is what we've done this year. Honoring the divine. What can you do to make more room for sacred interactions in your daily life? If we're going to be working on the seventh chakra this next month, which we are, you know, how can you make this more of a daily event rather than coming back in May and saying, what was that? What chakra? How can you take this with you and have this be something that is enriching your life every day? Even if it's only five minutes, Set some time aside each day to open yourself to the sacred and divine. It may be just viewing the night sky, realizing your place in the cosmos, or going inward. Stopping is a practice. At least once a day, simply stop and look around. See how far you can stretch your awareness. Notice your thoughts. There was a community, I think it was a Gurdjieff community, in which they would have that practice of stop. There would be a whistle or a bell or a siren, some indication, and that no matter where you were, no matter what you were doing, you were simply to stop. 
dead in your tracks until the whistle blew again or whatever. The purpose, in part, was just to heighten your consciousness so you're not getting, like, uh, lost. And also for balance. You know, if you're walking through life with balance, at any moment you can stop and be perfectly balanced. Are you always leaning over? Are you always off balance trying to get your balance? We used to do a whole bunch of playful things, like when we'd go to Green Lake. And uh, So I did this exercise once at Green Lake. I had a whistle. And we went to dinner to the cafeteria. It was like a huge, crowded cafeteria, you know. And I would just like give the whistle a tweet, and everyone in our group would stop. Another tweet, and we'd go on. <laughs> We did that a number of times. It was fascinating how your consciousness was aware of what was going on around you. So, in noticing your thoughts, your surroundings, and the statement they make to you. Native Americans were really good at that. I mean, noticing the animals, noticing the trees, noticing the, animals. the divine speaks to us through nature and through our environment just as much as through the clouds or the sky. So the seventh chakra is a ball, it's not a funnel. Savoring the delicious awareness of being alive. I didn't know what Green Lake was going to be about this year, you know, sometimes the last to know. And I'm just going along and all of a sudden, long, it comes to me, the art and science of savoring life. Savoring life. Now, you know, I might have mentioned to you, or maybe I didn't, in my study of this wonderful new positive psychology that folks are developing, they have actually made a science of savoring life. Because we are well steeped, many of us, in the work ethic. Get the job done, what do you do when the job is done? Go to the next one. And it's like, uh, uh, uh. Where is the pause in between? And savoring is not just a treat. It's not just a perk if you've done a good job. Truly enjoying our life is part of the point of being here. If you miss the point, you've got to do a duel. So you better enjoy it, whether you like it or not. So enjoying means truly relishing where we're at. Truly getting the magnificence of what this is. I mean, Yes, there are things like and created here, which put consciousness into, but which assist us in that enjoyment, consciously focusing on beauty. And you can find this anywhere in life. So, at Green Lake, we're going to take seriously the art and science of savoring. Now, there are four subcategories of savoring. There's basking, the art of basking, to know how to truly bask in uh, a sense of wellness and well-being. And there's thanksgiving, which is gratitude, giving gratitude for the bounty of the things that we have. There's marveling, being lost in the wonder of the moment. When's the last time you practiced marveling? <laughs> and finally, now this is over the top, luxuriating to truly luxuriate in your senses. Oh, that's simple. <laughs> no, we're not talking about being attached, you know, the, being a hedonist. But you know, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. Yes, you can get attached to pleasure, and you can also become fearful of it, or oblivious to it, or not recognize the divine talking to you through it. So I figured it was time for me personally to do it, so why not everyone else? That's what happens in leadership stuff. You get to, you know, you're in the third year now, you get to know this stuff. You know. Fasting. Fasting usually refers to abstaining from food. Yet we can fast from many things. Uh, fast from talking, working, reading the newspaper, spending money, playing music, using a computer, having sex. There are any number of things that occupy our awareness that we have gotten relatively attached to. 
The purpose is to open new places in consciousness, not to punish yourself. I had, and still have, some degree of attachment to food. And so fasting, to me, was like a dirty word. You know, it's like, it's a punishment for sure. You know, or some kind of a discipline. And so I didn't really get, until I worked with it for a while, that there is a distinct pleasure to not eating. That it's not all about giving something up. That there was actually a pleasure involved in this. And again, not an ego pleasure like, well, I went for three days without binging on chocolate. No, it's a quality, an experience of being that I was depriving myself of. I was depriving myself of the pleasure of not eating. <laughs> See, you're going to play with this. <laughs> Is that something like reverse psychology? <laughs> well, it may sound like it. It may sound like a gross rationalization, but it's not. Really? Okay, so come on, fast up here. Who has fasted and felt the pleasure? Okay. After so, hating it. To be sure. Yeah. It wasn't actually a pleasure in the fact that I fasted. It was pleasure in the fact that I was able to do it. Right, which is more of an ego pleasure. It's like, okay, I accomplished it. Mm -hmm. I made it through the whatever. Which is different. It's a form of pleasure. But to actually get the physical pleasure of what it is to feel that energy mm -hmm. that's not tied to a lump of mashed potatoes. It's a very light sense of energy and a distinct sense of pleasure. My fasting was not around food. It was around right now we're fasting in my home from TV. So there's no sound and just mm -hmm. that, that silence or mm -hmm. seeing the kids interact like we need to do something to keep ourselves busy, busy so they decide to play space, you know, just to do things and interact with one another. Mm -hmm. So I guess I've been witnessing that in my home. That's exactly what he's just about here. The purpose is to open new places in consciousness. So if we fast from TV, maybe we've got to look at one another. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God. I just wrote down the you know, fasting from complaining. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> fasting from kvetching. That's Sandra Ray's book. My friend Sandra wrote a book, The Only Diet There Is. Yeah. And it's a diet from negative thinking. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's a little section in that book called The Sausage Game, <laughs> which was she got the inspiration for in my kitchen. Uh, yoga Journal Magazine, I haven't done this, but I'd like to one day. It was the idea of fasting from having any sort of physical waste in a day. You know, so you're not throwing things out that are garbage. Mm -hmm. But to me, I was like, whoa, I mean, bringing awareness to what you're using, whether it's food or anything, and the consciousness of what kind of waste does that produce and what do I do with that waste? And so for a day not having any, mm -hmm. I, I, it was like, oh, that's huge. Mm -hmm. One day I'd have to do it, but right now it's like, whoa, I, I don't think I'm ready to do that. Yeah, I learned a lot about that in Africa. Mm. Nothing, not a hair, <laughs> <laughs> nothing is wasted, you know, gone without being used in some way. Mm -hmm. Meditation. There's no greater practice for developing the seventh chakra than meditation as essential to the spirit as eating and rest are to the body. It's nourishment to the soul. Produces the benefits that include increased intelligence, productivity, clarity, peace, well-being, and health. So there's countless techniques for meditation. The purpose in any meditation is to move beyond the normal contents of your consciousness. It's for the purpose of experiencing a higher state. Meditation itself consists of three elements, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, or concentration, absorption, and transcendence, or bliss. The first step is to concentrate your mind, to focus your attention. The second step is to move into absorption of a higher state until Meditation requires no effort. The third step is reaching samadhi, the bliss of enlightenment itself. So, try various practices over time. Pick one that suits you, and then stick with it for a while. 
only with repeated practice does meditation show its greatest rewards. Find a quiet, comfortable environment. The body needs to be in a low maintenance position so it can relax. And a straight back allows alignment of all the chakras. The various practices with this, a very simple one, but indeed powerful, is beginning meditation is just focusing on the breath. Focus on the inhale and the exhale. Practice until you find it easy to stay with the breath and you experience a calm and clear state. Another one is following your thoughts. Simply observe them dispassionately. Someone told me this the other day that that was their meditation technique, which worked perfectly for them, was to be a cat watching a mouse hole. And all of the thoughts are like just mice coming out of the mouse hole. And so, it's a, isn't that interesting? Now I'm thinking about those nuts. Isn't that interesting? And now, Kathy's foot. And there's a thought about the bottles. And, and I'm just observing and watching, you know, stuff go by. And Ken Wilbur favors that meditation is the only practice that's been scientifically proven to raise consciousness. There's many practices, undoubtedly, but studies are done on this. What you do is you step back from the content of consciousness, so you're just seeing nuts and feet and bottles, and, and it allows you then to recognize that you're more than nuts and feet and bottles, and so it kind of kicks you upstairs. And whatever level of consciousness you're at as you meditate, you transcend the content. So you might get to a level where you're now just aware of bliss states. Okay, as you meditate, you're just watching bliss states. You're not even a bliss state anymore. So whatever you're meditating on, you're not. So if I'm meditating on the candle, then I'm the observer. I'm the witness of the candle. I'm not the candle. Okay. If I'm meditating on my job or my activities in my life, or you're detaching from I'm, I'm what did, right. Or if I'm meditating on the quality of truthfulness, if I'm meditating on my soul, so whatever it is, I step back from it. Well, then I meditate on being the observer, and well, by golly, I'm not even the observer. When you're meditating, aren't you? Yes, there are different ways of, uh, you can have an object of meditation or you can not have an object. So you could meditate on a deity or on a quality or no mind, just being. Some people find that very difficult to do. It doesn't work for them. That's why the suggestion here is that you experiment. Someone may tell you, well, just do this. You try it and it's like, that doesn't work for me. So forget the whole thing. Mm -hmm. No, there's a way that works for you. So following your thoughts, simply observe dispassionately. Important thoughts, ideas, or reminders surface from the unconscious. When thoughts have been cleared, you're able to sink deeper into the meditation, to a place of no thought. Mantra meditation, another time. Simple sound repeated internally. Use the seed or vowel sound associated with a chakra center, for example. No, these are just techniques. They're not the experience itself. Open the seventh chakra is truly to tune into the divine source that lies behind everything and to become one with that source. So we're going to look at the excesses and deficiencies of the seventh chakra. Excessive characteristics association from the body, spiritual addiction, confusion, over intellectualization, living in your head, disconnection from spirit, and excessive attachments. Deficient characteristics of the seven chakras, spiritual cynicism, a closed mind, learning difficulties, rigid belief systems, and apathy. Balanced characteristics, spiritual connection, wisdom and mastery, intelligence, presence, open-mindedness, ability to question, ability to assimilate and analyze information. 
All right. What we're going to do is look at our handout and the page that has the final assessment and plan for balancing your seventh chakra. And do the first three questions here. Do the first three questions. My strength in the chakra, my weakness, and my goals are. Okay? So let's write that down now. And if you need to take a break or use lavatory, you can do it during this writing time. So we're going to write. If you take a break, though, yeah, we'll do it quietly while people are still writing. So on your sheet, there's a place for writing down the tools that you want to use and what your commitment is what tools you want to use during this next month, and what commitment you make for your seven chakra work this month. I am honored to be cohorts with you in this work. So uh, I feel that this seven chakra is going to be popping the cork for us this month in terms of manifestation. I hereby declare this manifestation month. <laughs> and, uh, as we're bringing our liberating current and the manifesting current together, we're opening the doors for that to happen. So let's get on with living our dreams. Mm -hmm. Blessings to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.